Michelle, we're looking forward. We're going to deep, dig deeper into manuscripts, I believe, today. And paratext. Yes. Today, okay. today we're going to talk about manuscripts and printed books. Okay. Uh, so last week we talked about the Geniza, which is more archival sources. So if you're thinking about kinds of primary sources, um, you have documents like collections of letters and correspondence and things like that. And that's really what we talked about last week. Tonight, we're going to move into codices. So what, you know, the books that you see on the shelves of your library. Um, but uh, the books we're talking about today, I don't think are on many of your shelves, although if they are, you're very lucky. Um, so we're going to discuss today both print and manuscript. Um, and some of it, I'm going to focus mostly on what's called the early modern period, so the 15th century to the 18th century. That's what I know best and sort of where I spend the most time. Um, but I will discuss some medieval manuscripts as well. Um, because, but, but what I want to, the reason I'm talking about both today, um, I want to just emphasize is because they both were used even after the invention, the, the um, invention of movable type in the Western hemisphere, eh, sorry, in Western Europe, in, in Europe, in the West, not in the Western hemisphere, um, manuscript, which is writing by hand, um, as opposed to printing, still very much continued to be a thing that was that was done within with throughout that period. Um, so it wasn't like Gutenberg came around and everybody stopped writing by hand. Printing was very expensive. I'll talk about it in a little while. Um, and so manuscripts really continued as well. Um, and as a, okay, so sorry, <laughs> I forgot about my, my, my breakdown, what we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to start with just a brief introduction to manuscripts um, and studying manuscripts, what you look at when you talk, to, talk about manuscripts, handwritten books. Um, we're going to talk about illustrations because there's so much you could take in, you know, a semester long course on illustration, but we'll go through a, just a little bit. Um, then we'll talk about print and um, just the beginnings of print. We will discuss title pages, colophons, and other paratexts. So paratexts are texts that are not the text. So when you open uh, Shulchan Aruch, the everything that is not the Shulchan Aruch itself, everything that is not the main text, so the title, everything that's written here, basically, title page, colophon, um, and any everything around the book um, is what we'll be talking about. Um, and then uh, I'm going to, this came up last week as well, but a bit about what contemporary people, how they responded to print and the printed book. Um, and then, of course, we'll, we'll go into a little bit of how you, your, you could find some of these books um, and some of the resources that are available to you online. So um, I'm going to, I just want to show you this image to complicate a little bit when people talk about print and manuscript. Printed books are one thing and manuscripts are another thing and they're often categorized separately and they're sometimes, I, I, in our library, they're shelved separately. And, and sometimes they're dealt with, and they're de often dealt with completely differently. Um, but what I want you to look at here, this is a printed title page that's used on a manuscript. And actually it's in Arabic and Latin, but the Hebrew was handwritten and the rest of the book is a manuscript. This is a printed text of the, I'm not sure exactly what it is, um, but there's a, it's part of prayer. Um, but there's a long manuscript handwritten commentary all around it. This is a book that was printed, but then some of the book is missing. So it was completed by hand in manuscript. This is actually just a flap of the book. Uh, it's part of the binding. It's, it's a part of the enclosure on the binding that uses a piece of a printed, of printed paper in order to, to strengthen it. Um, and this is a manuscript, a handwritten book, that includes a printed picture in it as part of the decoration. So don't, you, you can't have, you, and, and on libraries, we'll talk about this a little bit more next week, but in libraries in the early modern period in the 17th century, owners didn't say, oh, here are my printed books and here are my manuscripts. They were all one, one kind of book together. But we're gonna ignore that, even though I'm giving you this caveat that they are different. Um, and we're gonna talk about manuscripts and then talk about print. So when we think about manuscripts, um, these are all Hebrew manuscripts that you see right here. Um, and 
they all look different. The inks are different. The script is different. Uh, the way that it's written on the page is different. And so you can learn a tremendous amount about the off the scribes of these manuscripts who were not necessarily the authors, the, just the people who wrote it, um, by studying something called codicology. Codicology is the study of manuscripts as cultural artifacts for historical purposes. So when you look at a manuscript and you say, I want to learn about history by looking at this manuscript, that's codicology. It, it includes the makeup of the manuscript, how the parchment or paper is prepared, um, how it's lined. So they used to, you can't see it on, on these actually, but I, on this manuscript, I know it's there. You just can't see it in the photograph where they would take a piece, usually of bone, something hard that they would actually make lines on the page so that they would write in a straight, they would write straight. Um, and it was done differently in different places. Um, and how a book is bound because binding differs by, by location. So you see in these six images, we have a 14th century formal Spanish hand, we, an 18th century Jerusalem hand written in Jerusalem, a 14th century Spain, but a semi-cursive. So this is more of an informal hand, a 16th century Yemenite hand, a 16th century Italian hand, and an 18th century Syrian hand. And when I, the, these are all official designations according to the to paleography, which is the study of old scripts and is part of uh, codicology. And many times you'll see, if you look at a description of a manuscript, you'll see that it's described as 16th century Yemen. And that's because it has features that are distinct to 16th century Yemen. The founder of the field of Hebrew codicology uh, was Malachi Bet Aryeh, who is, is in Jerusalem. Um, and I'll share in, in the chat a little bit later when I'm able to get to the chat, um, a, a PDF of his, of his works in English. And he goes through, it's, it's a scientific analysis essentially of manuscripts, but it's, it's amazing to see the level of work that he's done in, a, in understanding manuscripts based on their, their materiality, based on how they are made. Um, a more lay person's book on studying Hebrew script is Ada Yardini's uh, Book of Hebrew Scripts. And Ada Yardini's book is, is wonderful. It's very clear. And she goes through and describes every, she has these pages that are just filled with letters of the alphabet in different handwriting. So you can look at it and you can really understand the diversity of, um, of hands across the Jewish world and across time. Um, and I'll, I'll show you just the page from that after the talk once I'm, once I'm finished uh, sharing my screen. So that is, that's just to start. When you're looking at a manuscript, you wanna look at what you can already get where and when that manuscript is written just by looking at the handwriting. So pictures, um, pictures tell us all sorts of things. Um, it, I, this is one of my favorite manuscripts. This is from the Darmstadt Haggadah, um, which was produced in Heidelberg in 1430. It's called Darmstadt because it's physically located in Darmstadt today. Um, but what's really interesting about this Haggadah is that scholars say that it was written for a woman. Why do they say it's written for a woman? So I think just looking at this, you can get, you can get a sense of it. Um, how often do you see on a medieval Ashkenazi Kagada images of people who are clearly women holding books on their lap, clearly having some kind of learned conversation with men or with other women? This looks like it was produced for a learned woman who would have been uh, living in that kind of environment. So we can see a few things from this manuscript. First of all, um, this idea that in the past women were not active, were not able to be active, were illiterate, were um, didn't necessarily know uh, Jewish texts. This this manuscript seems to show us another story. And then of course we have things like about how people dress. So you can see the distinction between men and women. They're both wearing long robes uh, to the floor, but there's a clear distinction. The women are some of the women are covering their heads, others are not. Uh, you see, you see the distinction in in the in the dress in as well. So there are different pieces that you can look at, and and whole. I mean, many books have been written um, on history based on art. Um, art history is is actually a, a thriving field because of that. I'm just gonna move this in. So the Darmstadt, yeah, somebody answered that. Um, 
the paleo. Okay, sorry. I'm going I'm just checking on the checking on the chat a little bit. Um, so it's code code ecology um, and paleography are the two are the two words that I was using. And then uh, the Yemenite manuscript. I don't believe it had Nicodelion. Um, although let's just take a look. Um, oh, uh, yes, it does. Well spotted. Uh, that's known as Babylonian Nikud. And that's when the Nikudot are actually on top of the letters rather than below it. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. So once I open the chat, I'm going to stick my little uh, links in there as well. So this is Malachi Beit Arye's uh, work on codicology. And here is the link to Ade Yardini's Book of Hebrew Script which I highly recommend, it's, it's just a wonderful book. Okay, so more on, on images. Um, in the medieval period, Christians required Jews to look different and they had to wear some kind of hat, which we know about because we have all of these manuscripts. And in this case, it's actually a printed book. This is a Christian book. Um, I didn't include the title, I apologize. I can, I can follow up on it. Um, but these are all different materials that all show the same hat, with, which was somewhat rounded with the pointy part on top um, that the Jews were required to wear to distinguish them as Jews, because otherwise the Christians were concerned that nobody would know that they were Jews and they might go into a, a relationship with them or they so Jews might do horrible things that they couldn't be identified and, you know, warned and people warned against them. Another example that I find really interesting in images is, um, is of Jerusalem. And, oh, I forgot I put this one in. <laughs> okay, so this is an example actually of Jews not wearing the Jews hat. This is from the earliest illustrated Haggadah. And part of the reason that it's dated to Iberia or the Ottoman Empire is because of the clothing, because this is the known clothing that Jews would wear at that time. So this, these are just images from this fragment, this fragmented Haggadah. Um, <clears throat> sorry about that. Okay, so Jerusalem and the temple. So many of you might be familiar with sort of a standard Roman uh, architecture of what, what at, that people present as a picture of the Beit HaMikdash or the, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. Um, but that is the modern rendering of what we think it may have looked at because of when it was created, the second temple, when it was built, what we know about architecture from the time, what we know about the people that were involved in the building. But people who lived at different periods illustrated the, both the temple and the city of Jerusalem based on what they saw. They did not necessarily, they weren't able to travel easily. Travel was very hard. If you would travel to Jerusalem, you usually planned to stay there. Um, and they certainly, they, and so most people could not, could not draw a picture of this place based on what was actually there. And so they built it, they, they drew pictures based on what they saw around. And so we see how it would have looked, how people thought it might look based on Darmstadt, which definitely has some similarities to the, the famous picture that's, that's shown today, but that's based on, um, how it how it is described in rabbinic texts. So there are certain things that have to be that have to be there. Um, but if you look at the Barcelona one, this is this is completely different. A view of Jerusalem from the Czech Republic looks pretty much like it, it, it Prague would have looked at that time. Um, or from Corfu, they, they this is this is a standard temple image that appears in print as well of this was the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, whether or not just based on what was circulating at the time. So again, thinking about how people, people, people thought of, imagined what they saw. So they imagined that, that places would look similar to the places that they lived in. Okay, um, so we're gonna turn to a printed volume just to talk a little for our last slide on, on pictures. This is a Haggadah printed in Prague in 1526. Um, and it's only one example. And many essays have been written. There's a lot of work that's been done on the images of the four sons in the Haggadah across time. Because looking at the pictures of the four sons, 
can give you an understanding of what people saw as good, as wise, as wicked, as simple, as you know, being unable to, to ask a question. And so here we have the wise one who is bearded and looks like he's in the middle of teaching a very important lesson. Um, we have a, uh, the wicked son who's dressed as a soldier. And that actually was very standard for centuries because the worst possible thing that a Jew could think about uh, was a soldier. Soldiers were always the ones who came and you know, decimated the towns. For their, the idea of their child becoming a soldier was probably the worst thing that, there, that could happen to their child as far as being wicked and, and cruel. In the, in the later centuries, like in the 19th and 20th centuries, you see how that shifts because what's bad turns into something entirely different. And that's really interesting sometimes to see um, how, those, how those things change. And then here's the simple son. So that's just one example, but I encourage you to, to take a look at lots of, lots of different four sons because you, you really learn a lot about the society that produced those Haggadot. Okay, so we, we sort of stepped into print accidentally in the Prague Haggadah, so I'm gonna take us directly into print. So in um, the 1550s, Johannes Gutenberg comes with his, with his movable type and uh, printing is a skill that is a secret skill that is, starts in Germany and Jews are not allowed to join the guilds in Germany. So Jews are not allowed to print in Germany. But what happens is some of the printers who worked with Gutenberg ended up traveling elsewhere and they, they spilled the secret. They taught other people their skills. And so the very first Hebrew books we find are printed in Rome. They're not identified as printed in Rome um, in the late 1460s or early 1470s, but we know that they're printed in Rome by looking at the physical makeup of the books. So um, let me just step back a second. Um, so the very first printed books are called Incunabula, um, and I could put that in the chat as well. Um, Incunabula, sorry. Incunabula is, uh, comes from a Latin word that means uh, cradle because it's from the cradle period of printing. Um, and it's set to you know, the origins of printing until 1501, which is a somewhat arbitrary date, but it's trying to encapsulate those very, very early days when printers were trying to figure things out. So if you look at these um, books that are here, you'll see that there are no nikudo. Because if you think about using a single tiny piece of metal for every single word, you then have to add a dot or a dash to, to make the vowel sounds, that's really complicated. So the very first books um, do not have Nikud. By the 1480s though, the printers had figured it out and you see some really, some really impressive um, layouts and designs of the, of the prints. Um, the books that were printed in the first years of printing were not biblical texts. Um, this is because a Bible would be in every synagogue and um, even the, the, uh, the Nath part, the, the prophets and the, the Ketuvim, um, would have potentially been in the synagogue as well for Haftarot, for special readings. And so there would have been more access to that. What people wanted, if, the, if you were going to print anything, if you were going to spend the money to build a press, which was not an insignificant um, investment, to buy the paper, to hire a, a goldsmith, to set your type, and all of those things, you want to print something that you know is going to be a bestseller. So what are they printing? They're printing legal works, halakha. So the Arba Aturim, they print uh, one volume of Shailot Chuvot. You see uh, uh, Shlomo Ibn Aderet's, uh, the Rashba, his, his questions and answers in halakha. They printed Talmuds. They printed commentaries on the Bible, but not the Bible itself, um, initially because those were, those were the books that people would use and that they could make money on. <laughs> Other books that they, that they produced were books like Avicenna's Canon. So there's a volume of the Canon, which is a medical work. It's basically a medical textbook that comes out of the Islamic world, translated into Hebrew and printed in 1492 in Naples in a massive edition because many Jews were doctors and they wanted access to this medical textbook. And so that was printed because that was an important enough book to be printed. So again, you, when you look at the books, you can learn a lot about the people 
and what their what their intellectual needs were, what they wanted to what they wanted to have, because people would only print what they thought would sell. Okay, so back to Rome. How do we know that these books are printed in Rome? If the books don't say anything about where they're printing, we have the names of the printers, but not where they were printed or when. So Moses Marks was a bibliographer and scholar of the Hebrew book. And he's the one who definitively identified these books as having been produced at Rome. Um, Marx brings a few different pieces of evidence to prove this. He cites a book that was printed in Venice, 1566. So this is about 100 years later. And that book refers to question number 396 in the work of Solomon Benadaret. So the work of the Rashba. So we have the Rashba here, and it's, it's uh, produced in a series of questions and answers. Each, each set, each uh, question is numbered. And this book refers to question number 396 in this, in the work, and I'm quoting from this book from Venice, in his responses that were printed at Rome. So there was no other copy of the Rashba's Teshuvah that was printed, that was known to have been printed at Rome. So this was the only possible um, book also because it was the only book where the number actually matched the subject that was being discussed in that later book. So he figured out that this, this book was printed at Rome. But what about the rest of them? He looked, so then he started looking at the physical aspects of the book. And I'm gonna get a little bit technical here, so forgive me for a minute. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote Marx because I think he describes it really well. He says, we find that all printers who began their work under the influence of Schweinheim and Panartz, Schweinheim and Panartz were two printers who were trained by Gutenberg and came to Rome before 1471, showed a definite preference for a wide folio column on leaves about 40 centimeters tall. So he's literally measuring the size of the page and the height of the book. 40 centimeters is quite high. In consequence, he says, we are led to believe that Hebrew books showing the same distinctive characteristics, one of them listing three Romans as printers and another proved by an independent quotation, that's what we just said earlier, to have been printed at Rome, were likewise produced at Rome during the same period. So this is an example of a printed work by Schweinam and Parnarts at Rome. And you see the very straight, very solid column but this, you, what you can't see, because you're not looking at the physical books, you're looking at digital surrogates of the books, um, is that they're almost exactly the same size. And because they're so large and so, so distinctive in their paper, he said these absolutely have to, be, uh, have, to have been printed um, under the influence of Schweinheim and Parnats, who were at Rome. So it must be that, that, that they were in Rome. Also, given this other point about the tissue book. And you see that the typography, so the actual typefaces of this print are the same in both of these books. And they're distinct from all of the other printings that were produced uh, during the 15th century. So they were clearly produced at the same press. Marx also notes things like initial blank leaves. So they put an extra piece of paper in before they started the work and uh, the type itself, like I said, to show the similarity of those of Schweinheim and Ponart's printed during this period. So the, he cites six books that were printed during this period of 1469 to 1473. And those are accepted as the very first printed Hebrew books. Um, and I just want to emphasize if Gutenberg was 1555 or so, uh, give or take, depending on, on how you want to count it, we're saying that we're within 15 years of the beginning of movable type in Europe, Jews were printing Hebrew books. This was something that immediately Jews needed to do because here's a way to produce, to produce books, to, to spread Torah, as it were, um, in, such a, in such a wide and important way. Another thing that happens with the, with the 15th century printed books that we see is how things, um, how things solidify. So, Printing was not only in Italy, but it was also in Spain. And there were printings of the Talmud in both Spain and in Italy. What happens is, as many of you know, the Jews of Spain were expelled. Um, I'm sorry, somebody pointed out that I said uh, Gutenberg was 
was 1555. Of course, I meant 1455. Thank you for the correction. Um, so but the Jews of, of Spain were expelled in, in 1492. The Jews of Portugal are expelled in 1497. The Jews of Portugal, I should point out, Lisbon, the very first book ever printed in Lisbon was a Hebrew book. And Jews in Lisbon were printing Hebrew and non-Hebrew books during the 15th century. So they were introducing type. They were introducing um, print into, into Portugal. This was, this was very important. But then, of course, they get expelled. So what happens is the Sanchino version of the Talmud, which includes, as you see, you see the Guadalajara, which is a Spanish press, has one commentary on the Talmud. They just have Rashi there. Um, if they would use a second commentary, they would have used Ramban. They would have used Nachmanides. They would not have used the Tosafists, who were Ashkenazi and who had a, an Ashkenazi bend. These were Sephardim. So they would not have studied Tosafa. However, because printing ends up being, um, ends up moving so much into Italy, the Italian type of Talmud is what becomes the standard. And Tosafot becomes the standard second commentary on the Talmud for everyone, Sephardim and Ashkenazim and Italkim and everybody else, because, because Jews would use what was available. So you start, if you have Rashi and Tosafot in front of you, that's what you're going to be studying. So that really impacts the way the Talmud then is studied as well. Um, in addition, we have inf information about early printing in Spain from the Inquisition. We don't have examples, for instance, about a press in uh, Montalban, which is in Aragon, but we do have inquisitorial accusations of a Jew named Juan de Lucina and his daughters Teresa and Juana, and possibly others. He actually had six daughters who were printed in he who printed in Hebrew. That was the accusation against them was that they were printing in Hebrew type, so they must be um, crypto Jews. Similarly. Alfonso Fernandez de Cordoba was a type designer whose name we know only because he was sentenced to death in 1483 by the Inquisition in Valencia for working closely with Jews and helping to produce Hebrew books. So this was 1483, it's before the Jews were expelled, but he was a converso, so he's supposed to be behaving as a Christian, and yet he's designing Hebrew type, so it must be that he's secretly practicing as a Jew, and so he was actually sentenced to death for this. Um, okay, so where else are we going to learn from Hebrew, learn about people and that are connected to books? So the next part we're going to talk about is a colophon. So colophon comes from a Greek word. It means finishing touch. Um, and that started with manuscript and then continued into the first 50 or so years of print. After once, once you get into the 16th century, they move to title pages as we know today, and that's, that's a different story. But we have all sorts of information that we can get from the colophon. So I'm gonna give you just a few examples here. The first one is a manuscript uh, at Columbia, um, which I'm rather fond of, that actually has two colophons. It's a Kabbalistic manuscript, Sefer HaOra by Yosef uh, Jekatila, um, produced either in 1325, as it says here, or in 1405, as it says here. So what's going on? So the, the scribe's name was Moshe Barzilai. Moshe was a very, very precise copyist. And he was copying a manuscript that is now housed in Florence, Italy, at the Biblioteca Lorenziana, which we know because it has this exact colophon. And he copied, when he was copying the manuscript, he copied the, the colophon itself. So it wasn't that it took him 80 years to finish the manuscript, but rather, who knows how it's, it is possible, not all scribes were very good translators of Hebrew, they were, they were good writers of Hebrew, but that didn't mean that they necessarily knew what it was they were writing. Um, and so he, in this case, he copied the actual colophon of the previous manuscript that he was copying from into the new manuscript that he was building. Another example, and this one is, is over a thousand years old, is the Leningrad Codex. This was produced in Cairo and is currently at the Russian National Library in St. Petersburg. And you see here, Anish Muel Ben Yaakov. And here's the, the inscription of the scribe who is writing who he was when he wrote the, when he wrote the volume 
And then a bunch of these are usually pesukim or, or other kinds of texts surrounding the whole thing as a decorative, as a beautiful sort of decoration. Here's an example of Yoel ben Shimon, who is known, famously known for his um, illustrations. He was a 15th century illuminator of Hebrew manuscripts. He's known for quite a few Haggadot. Um, and here again, he writes, I, I, Yoel ben Shimon produced this book. He was also known as Faibush Ashkenazi. Um, this one is maybe not as beautiful as the others, but it's a lovely story. This is a midrash, Al Parshat Vayechi. So it's the midrash in, in, our, in New Aramaic. It's produced in Kurdistan, where the Jews did, uh, spoke Aramaic in 1670. And the scribe writes that he produced this for another person. So somebody hired him to write this book. And he writes the date on which Yalda li ishi, ishti, my wife had a baby. So here he is writing a text for somebody else and he sort of can't control himself. He's like, but I need to tell you what just happened um, because he's so excited. So he includes that information, that very personal information in the colophon. So colophons then we have in prints, in, in printed books. Uh, this is the, the colophon for the Arba Aturim, which is the first dated book printed at Piave de Sacco in 1475. Um, and I'm going to just read real quick a translation of this poem because it gives you a sense of one of the wonderment that these people felt as they were able to produce these books. So it's a it's a loose translation. So forgive me. Um, Wisdom and am I and crown of all science hidden am I a mystery to all without pen stroke my imprint stands patent without scribe lo a volume appears. One instant, an ink army of flowing. Without guidelines, straight stands every word. Do you wonder at Debara the prophetess, the mighty, who ruled with the pen of the scribes? Had she seen me displaying my power, she'd have taken me a crown for her head. So here you see how they're, they're embracing this, but also seeing with wonderment. And another, another colophon describes print as, um, writing with many pens with, without a miracle, the ability to write with so many, so many pens. Another colophon writes about how, how previously you had to have five books in front of you in order to properly study. And now you can just have one book um, and, actually, and actually learn to write. In this one, we have Abraham Konat writing his colophon and they often were decorative. Uh, this happened with manuscript as well, where at the very end, they sort of made stylized images of the, of the end of their text. And I should point out that this is indeed a printed book. It's a very different kind of typeface. This is produced in Mantua. It was unique to Mantua. Um, and again, this is the period at which um, decisions are being made around print and what will be accepted. So just like you don't often see this kind of type, which is more of a Central European type, uh, in your modern Hebrew printed books, you also don't see this kind of type in your modern Hebrew printed books because that's not what ended up selling the most. That's not what ended up being sort of the, the fan favorite. Um, what's important about this colophon is that Avram Konat writes that every day he, he writes about the output of a printing press. He writes that there was 1,000 pages every day, twice with love. And he, of course, he's referring to the the a uh, verse that talks about saying Shema every day, twice with love. But scholars have looked at this and said, okay, wait, let's make some calculations. If you make, if you print 1000 pages a day, every day, twice with love, then twice, you don't, the love part isn't necessary, but if then is that a thousand pages every day? Is it 2000 pages every day? Can we figure out how many pages a press would produce and thus how many books a press would produce over a period of time. And that's part of the calculations that are used to come out with the, um, the statistic, as it were, that, that um, early printed, 14, 15th century printed books usually produced about 300 copies uh, per edition. The last colophon I'll show you here um, is one of my favorites. I have a lot of favorite things. Um, and this is that of the wife of Abraham Konat. You see, Anochi Astalina Eshet, um, I'm not sure what that is, um, Ishi um, Abraham. 
So she is the wife of Avraham Konat, and she's printing in 1474. She's actually the earliest woman known to be printing um, with movable type. And so she clearly was a partner with her husband in this press. And we only know, we know about her because she signed the work that she produced in this colophon. So we have all sorts of ways that we, we can learn about people. Again, looking at the paratext, looking at those pieces of the text that are not the actual text. So then we move into the 16th century and we have title pages. So here's a title, here's an example of a title page. You have the title of the work, Sacre Mechlo, which is a work of, of Dikduk. It's a, a work of grammar by David Kimpri. Um, and this is a description of that it was produced by Gershom Ish Sonchin. Um, so he, this is all about the printer. Gershom Sonchino now goes into the story of his life. This is printed in 1533 in Constantinople. And he goes into a long story about, um, I call it Sonchino's Lament, about how he had to travel through many places. He starts off in Italy and he goes to a few different places in Italy. He's in Salonika for a little bit and then he ends up in Constantinople. What do we learn about him? Well, he says that he produced 30, uh, 23 Masechta of Talmud. He produced uh, 23 tractates of Talmud. However, he says, but I was run out of town basically by that terrible guy, Bomberg, who's producing the entire Talmud. And so um, I just couldn't keep up and I couldn't, you know, he was running me out of business. And then he says, but I was so, here's what I did. I took care of the, the, um, the, the Bruché, those who were kicked out of Spain and of Portugal. And I made, created so many books for the Jewish people. I was, I was promoting, you know, Judaism as it were. And he says, and he just goes on and on about how, how look at how important the work that I, I do is. And so we learn all about his history. He talks about his grandfather who was in, his great grandfather who was in Germany, who ended up in Soncino, which is where they took the name from. Um, and we learn all about this whole family from this one title page. And the family has been printing since the 1480s. This is, this is 1533. So we get a tremendous amount of information, again, from reading those pages of a book that you just normally turn past because you're trying to get the, to the content of the book. Another example of a title page, and this is another example of uh, manuscript and print together. It's actually a manuscript. Um, it's Chaim Vital's Derech It's Chaim, which is a Kabbalistic manuscript. Uh, this, is, this is produced in the 18th century. And the owner or one of the owners of the manuscript wanted a printed title page for the book. However, he writes, I, I don't know what book this is. I, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what this is. Um, it's a work of Kabbalah. He owned it, the, uh, it maybe. Um, and we don't, but we don't know much else about it. They, so sometimes title page have a pages have a tremendous amount of information on them. And sometimes it has a whole lot less. Okay, so we spoke a little bit, we spoke earlier about identifying, about the importance of the material of the book, about the physical makeup of the book and identifying the Roman books before. Um, so now we're gonna turn to what I call my favorite book ever, um, which is the Arba'a Turim printed in Constantinople in 1493. Um, I love it not because it is a work of halakha. I don't claim to be an expert in Arba'a Turim, but because of the story that this single book can tell. So Audrey Athenberg, who was a tremendous scholar of specifically the early printed book of Incanabula, who passed away um, just a couple of years ago in, in 2019, um, called the, the Arba Aturim a bestseller among the Hebrew Incanabula, which produced, um, because it produced 13 editions within 20 years. So within the first 50 years of Hebrew printing, we have, we know of about 150 editions, actual copies of books that are produced. And of those, 13 of them, which is not a small number considering, um, are all Arba Aturim, because halakha is very important for Jewish life. This one, I think, is, is quite special. So what do we see here? We see, um, an, we, we see a woodcut, 
This is a, a decorated initial at the beginning of a text. We see some square type here. We see some cursive type um, and then some extra sort of decorations. This was the printer's mark of the Ibn Achmias brothers who printed it in Constantinople in 1493. And then some extra decorations here. So what did Offenberg discover? He compared the woodcut, he compared all of the types to all of the known um, types that existed um, in, in this period. He found that the woodcuts are, are the same as those from Ijar in, in Spain, um, which also were the same as those in Lisbon. So those two, those two presses were either sharing type or one moved to the other place. He, find, he found, and that's the woodcut and the square, he found that the semi-cursive type, so this type here, came from Naples. And then he looked at the actual paper. So there were watermarks on the paper because the paper was produced by a particular paper company who had their own mark. And so we can date uh, paper based on the watermarks, which tell us where and when the paper was produced. So the paper is dated to Venice or Northern Italy in 1493. So what we have here is the story of one family who was expelled from Spain. They started off in Ijar. Maybe they went to Lisbon, possibly, because the, the text, the, uh, the, these pieces are the same. Then they went either to Naples or to Venice. They went to both of those places with the, with the idea that they were going to print a book. So they had to pick up a whole bunch of paper in Venice. You couldn't get paper in Constantinople. So if you're planning to print in Constantinople, you had to get the paper in Venice. And then they end up in Constantinople where Jews can live safely as Jews because it's under uh, the Ottomans. It's, it's an Islamic uh, land. It's no longer, under, it's not under Christians. And they, and they print this book. So in a single book, you essentially have the story of, of Spanish Jewry because so many Jews were expelled from Spain, were expelled from Portugal and fled to the Ottoman Empire. But in this case, you can actually track their journey directly through looking at their books. One more really interesting piece that I found in this book um, was also in a, in a little thing that you see. Um, so a signature mark is a mark that's similar to, it's, it's not a page number, but it can be compared to a page number. It was printed on the book to guide the binder as to how to bind the book. The Arba'atu Rim is a four volume work. So there are four sets of signatures in the book. Four, um, it, volume one has its own set and, and on. In the first volume, we see that page 15 is numbered as Yud He, which, which in, in Hebrew numeration equals 15. It also happens to be a name of God. In volume two of the book, you see that they changed it to Tet Bav which also equals 15. So the numbering is the same, but something happened. So you can sort of imagine the conversation that took place in the shop. They printed one set and then they said, oh wait, are we gonna get it? We shouldn't print the name of God for numbering. We have to change it to something that equals the same amount um, and yet is not the name of God. So you also see these little, dis these little conversations that happened that end up changing the makeup of, of a particular book. If you look closely enough at the book. So I'm going to end with just a couple of chubot. Um, we have the Maharsha, who, was, who lived in the 16th and early 17th century. In the beginning of his commentary on the Talmud, this is particularly on the Agadic portion of the Talmud. He has two introductions to the Talmud. Um, he writes a, a polemical discussion of the dangers of using printed volumes in your study of the Talmud. And he says, the printers don't know anything. They're printing, if they don't, if there's a word missing, they just make it up. They're not sure what they're doing. And if you have a choice between an older volume and a newer volume, definitely use the newer volume because definitely, use, sorry, the older volume because the newer volumes are bound to have mistakes. Um, and and you're, gonna, you're gonna find all of these problems because the printers are just messing everything up, which is mind blowing when you think about how we view the printed text as the authoritative text, as the most important text. And yet, immediately following the, the onset of print, the rabbis were very concerned about the authenticity of these books that were being printed. 
And in some ways you can think about some of the concerns that come up with, um, with online texts. When you put stuff online, if you just translate everything, you have the Zohar translated online, that makes people very concerned. Um, and these are similar kinds of concerns about access to materials, about how, how things can be changed and, or how they can be misinterpreted. And that was a definite concern during that time. Um, another example that we have, I'm sorry, I didn't translate this one, was on the, um, on the holiness of a printed text. The question that was brought um, to the Ture Zahav was, is a printed text, does a printed text have the same holiness as a written text, as a, as a manuscript? And he goes through a whole discussion where he brings in the stones of the breastplate of the coin, where he says that's not something that was written with ink, and yet that had a special kind of holiness. So just like something that was of stone and had letters on it is still holy. So as well, these books who are printed with that are printed rather than being written by hand also have a measure of holiness to them and you should treat them accordingly. So these are, these are both just examples of, of how uh, contemporaries were grappling with, um, with the onset of print. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Kalman, for that. Now, I don't know if you can verify that, but that's what I believe, that the Marsha was originally printed into. And that's why, of course, and when the standard issue of the Marsha, his comments on Halakha are printed in block letters, and his comments on Agadar are yeah. printed in Rashi letters, because they're originally two separate books. And okay. I don't know if it was the Marsha himself, or, or later on, insisted that it be made into one, in order that people, you know, I got to, I don't have to learn that book. I'll just learn the halacha book. I think today people use the marsha much more for Agada than for halacha. Yeah, <laughs> and interestingly, I mean, I, I can talk about another book just real quick. Um, the Enyako, which is produced in the, uh, the latter part of the 16th century after the banning of printing of the Talmud in Italy, which we'll talk about a little bit next week, um, that was then used as an entry into Talmud. So Agada became the only thing that was allowed to be printed. Um, and so the Ein Yaakov was sort of a workaround to get to Talmud in places where the Talmud was banned. So you have all of these different sort of ways of, which, which might be because he lived precisely at that time. So I wonder if that's why uh, there are two separate, um, there are two separate uh, volumes. Um, I wanted to just give you a quick one run through of some of the some of the online resources because it's there's there's quite a lot there um, but before we do that um, I just wanted to take a breather for a minute and see if there were any questions any questions feel free to speak up okay or, or chat was, and we're chatted there I see there was a request for the the citation for Moses marks it's um it's on the it's on the dating of the the Roman imprints, I believe, or something like that. You could send me an email. I'll send you. I'll, I'll send you the full citation. Um, I was going to include it initially, and the the titles get very long, and I don't think everybody everybody wants all those titles. Um, okay, I'll give it one more minute, and then I'm going to share yet another screen. Okay, feel free to interrupt me as we go. Um, let me see find the right screen. Well, while we wait, I don't know if you yeah. want to comment. The I know for many years, the uh, En Yaakov was a book people studied instead of the Talmud. So I always assumed, because it's kind of easier, you know, they don't have to get into Yehu Shalom Midat, they discuss the Agadot. But if what you're saying, if it was a work around the Talmud, it could be because that was the only printed books they had. They couldn't have the rest of the Talmud. So I don't know. I yeah, just, in Italy, in other places they were able to, but but it was banned in Italy for many years. Because Sorry, in, in Yaakov was often very amused. You know, people didn't study more. They say Yaakov was good. Yeah, yeah. Um, our illustrations paratext. Paratext is everything that's not the text. So I would say, yes, um, they're called illustrations. So they have their own category, but they're, they're something. It, I'm sorry, actually, let me say no. Um, a paratext is a text that is beyond the text. So it's specifically text. Sorry about that. Do you um, I just know wanna... about the competition in Italy between uh, 
Cremona and Mantua. And yes, we will discuss it next week because Zohar, that leads. Yes, Zohar. yes, yes. We're going to discuss it next week because that's what leads to the burning of the Talmud, of course. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and censorship and so much, so much else. Um, One question. Yeah. So, um, so marginal notes wouldn't be considered paratext, right? No, those are annotations. Annotations, they're separate, okay. They're separate, they're not printed with the text. But uh, but if they get incorporated into a printed text, then they become text. Then they're no longer then they're no longer marginal notes. Then they're part of the then they're part of the printed text. Okay. Okay. Um, the last two letters of the colophon that I translated. Um, oh, the letters of each line. Uh, yeah, I think that was the um, the Piaviti Sacco one. I believe it's a uh, it's a constant ending. So it's a teret, um, overet, giveret. Um, so it's just they all ended so that they would rhyme. So they set off the reshta of the last two letters of each word. Because I read the translation, you couldn't, you didn't hear that it rhymed. But that's why they were they were offset to show you that it was a rhyming, um, a rhyming poem. Um, was Bomberg able to drive out those who, like Sencino, uh, this gentleman uh, who prepared the uh, Gamora Singley because Bomberg was able to uh, produce all of them at one time? So, so yes. I would also say that Sanchino was maybe being a little overdramatic because Sanchino wasn't actually in Venice. He couldn't, well, there were a few things. Jews were not allowed to live in Venice or print in Venice at the time. So Bomberg essentially had a monopoly. He could do whatever he wanted with Hebrew print in Venice. Um, because nobody else could. And he had, I think, initially a 10-year monopoly, um, and then it got extended. Um, Angelo Piatelli has written has written some really good work on, on Bomberg's um, legal, like what allowed him to, to be able to do all of this work. Um, but because he had, he was very wealthy, so he had the means to do it, um, which Sanchino certainly did not have, and he had the church approval. So he had to have a huge operation. Sanchino was literally a wandering Jew who could not, he couldn't compete. There was, there was no, there was no possibility of him competing with Bomberg. And so his move to Constantinople was actually the best thing he could have done because there was only one or two other printers there. And then he was able to, to do printing. But he's, if you look at the Sanchino press, they're, they're throughout Italy. In fact, there's another article called uh, the Wander Years that refers to the Wander Years of the Sanchino Press because they literally, almost every, every book seems to be printed in, in yet another city because they're constantly traveling. Now, uh, now, Bomberg was not Jewish and he obviously had Jewish uh, people helping him. Were these people converts? No, they were Jewish. Uh, some were converts, but there were also Jews. Uh, there's another great article <laughs> uh, by Bruce Nielsen that talks about uh, the interplay between Jews and Christians at the Jew at the press of Daniel Bomberg. It's very interesting. Um, and actually, Bomberg got licenses for his Jews, so to speak, the ones that worked for him. They did not have to wear the yellow Jew badge that the Jews of Venice had to wear because he didn't want them to be accosted on their way to work, he wanted them to get to work. Um, and so he got an official dispensation for the people, for the Jews who worked for him so that they could get to work safely. Um, but another thing too, that's important to note is that Christians were also interested in Hebrew texts. And that's part of the reason that Bomberg was able to print the Talmud. The church was very interested in the Talmud because they wanted to be able to refute it. They wanted prints of the Talmud so that they could study it so that they could say, you say the Talmud says X, and that's why you won't follow the church, but actually here's why your interpretation is wrong. Um, and then there was, there was another school of thought that was interested in studying Hebrew works. If you truly wonder, want to understand the world of Jesus, you have to understand the world in which he operated. So that's not so much um, the Talmud as it is certainly the Bible and, and other texts around it, Midrash, texts around it, um, that he may have encountered or that that people around him would have been studying. So there's there's that piece as well. So there's there's a Christian interest in Hebrew books, which is why Bomberg is able to be so successful, because he's not only selling to Jews. 
Where did you, where did yeah. you grow up? And how did you become so interested in this field? Okay, um, before I get there, <laughs> Can I just, I'm just gonna really quick um, do my online resources piece and then I can um, give you a little bit. Um, there's there's somebody in the audience that shares a last name with me. Um, so I'm going to, let me just, let me just show you some things real fast. So um, if you're interested in seeing beautiful and amazing printed manuscripts and, uh, not printed, printed books and manuscripts, I highly recommend the Briginsky Collection website. Uh, Renee Briginsky is a collector in Zurich who has digitized a tremendous amount of his collection. Um, and some of the images in my slideshow actually came from his collection because he has been so generous as to share his wonderful, wonderful materials uh, with the world. Um, a lot of what I talked about with art, you can see in some of his materials. Um, he has decorated Esther scrolls, decorated Ketubot, and, and manuscripts and some of the printed books we talked about today. Um, another place to go to if you're interested in uh, Hebrew manuscripts is Ketiv. Ketiv comes out of the National Library of Israel. Um, and that is a database of Hebrew manuscripts from around the world. So I just looked at it this morning and it said it has almost 100,000 manuscripts from about 600 collections. So we're talking the goal that they have, and actually this is based on something that was an idea that was started by David Ben-Gurion when he started, when, when he, when the state of Israel was founded, he said, we also have to collect, look at all the destruction in Europe, look at all these manuscripts that were that were destroyed or missing or stolen. We have to collect all of this material. So some of it they collected physically, um, but some of it they ended up collecting virtually. So they created something called the Institute for Microfilmed Hebrew Manuscripts, and they sent photographers around the world to microfilm, which at that time was photography, as many Hebrew manuscripts as they could. And um, as a professor at Columbia likes to say, she went to the Nash, what was then Hebrew University to look at the Institute for Microfilmed Hebrew Manuscripts to see if there were manuscripts for her research. And she learned that there was a manuscript at Columbia where she was studying because she went to Jerusalem to find out that information, because there was more information in Jerusalem at the time about the manuscripts at her home institution, because nobody at, at Columbia knew what was there. Um, so it's an incredible resource. I put in Haggadah, um, but I want to just show you the filters. So um, there are a couple of things to look at. They have, they have records for nearly all manuscripts in existence, um, but you can filter by digital only, which are materials that you can see but not all manuscripts that are digitized are available outside of the National Library of Israel. So you have to look for available manuscripts that are available outside of the National Library. The other thing, the other filter that I put in here was illustrated because if you're really interested in looking, if you wanna print your own copy, for instance, of the uh, Prado Haggadah, which is an Italian Haggadah currently at the Jewish Theological Seminary, you can click this button to get to the page of JTS's digitized Haggadah, and you can, you can actually see it for yourself, and you can access this amazing illuminated manuscript, you know, from your desktop. So I highly recommend spending some time there. Another um, search that I've, that I've recommended to people, I once had somebody say, um, email me, um, I'm getting married and I am of Italian background and I really want to make an Italian ketubah the way that my ancestors would have made it. So I said, okay, great, go to the Ketiv website at the National Library of Israel. And again, one of the limitations that you can do is just ketubot. So you could limit to ketubot, you could limit to illustrated and you end up just scrolling through even a little bit, you can see some of the, these are just the thumbnails. Once you open it up, you can see just how amazing some of these are. This is Damascus. Um, and all of them very different. Um, so I highly recommend spending some time there. Um, because I'm at Columbia, I have to give you a shout out to our own collection of Hebrew manuscripts, um, which is, um, I think, quite a nice collection um, and also available online. Um, and then what else did I have here? The other thing to know about the National Library of Israel's catalog is that Merchav, um, is that they have a, a tremendous, and I'm gonna stop there because I see we're at time, but they have a tremendous amount of digitized printed books as well. And so if you search in their regular catalog, 
for printed books, you can you can find also links to digital copies of those books. So I encourage you all to sort of spend some time looking at the just tremendous amount um, of treasures that we have available um, online. Uh, Tashma and Tashma may have headed the, the IMHM. I I don't remember, um, but he that wouldn't surprise me at all if if he headed it. Um, the other person who's really in, who's really uh, well known is Benjamin Rickler, who produced a um, catalog of. Hebrew, of Hebrew manuscripts collections, which is sort of the go-to book if you want to find out about where Hebrew manuscripts are in the world. And it, it has a, a lot of material on history of, of Judaica collections generally um, that I think is really interesting because of course this is my topic. Um, but I'm going to stop there because we're, we're past time, so. Thank you. I don't know if you want to very briefly in one minute address, you know, how you got so interested. Oh, the question of how I got here? Um, this the very short answer is I like old stuff, um, and then I then I had wonderful mentors who who directed me toward libraries and guided me continuously along the way. Um, maybe I'll tell a little bit of that story next week because it has to do with the topic um, that we're talking about next week, which is what the annotations and the traces that people leave in books once they own them. So next week we're going to talk about what happens to the book once it comes off of the press. So we talked about all sorts of things that are involved in part of the creation of the book in, in making that book available to users. But what about the users? Who are the users? Um, and that's something that we'll, we'll talk about next week. And that's really um, something I feel very, very strongly about and um, is very well connected to what I call my origin story. So I'll give you that next week. Okay, thank you very if much. If you can wait. <laughs> okay, I, uh, we, we have no choice, patience, you know? Savlanut, thank you very much. Okay, uh, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., Dr. Marty Lection will continue a series on the Covenant Code, Parshat Mishpatim, uh, after Sinai, leading up to Shavuot, although he just emailed me, we we're going to continue, of course, at, not of course, but continue after Shavuot, uh, going through the beginning of Mishpatim. At 1 p.m., Rabbi Moshe Shulman will be giving his uh, series, continuing series on Midrash, and then at 8 p.m. Dr. Sokolo will do part two of the philosophy of mitzvot. Tomorrow we'll be talking about Tameha mitzvot as understood by Rav Sa'adja Gaon, the greatest of the Gaonim from the 9th and 10th century. Uh, you know, in the early manuscripts, whatever. And uh, Rasag, of course, one of the greats. His manuscripts are in the Geniza. Some of them. Oh, there, there you go. There. So, and um, and that's uh, that's our three classes tomorrow. Uh, Thursday, Benny Gazuntaid is starting his series on uh, three part ladies to, to Shavuot. I, I have to I have to double check. He's doing Maimonides um, curriculum for school. Yeah, he always has fascinating topics, Doctor Benny. Uh, the th three part series and leading up to issues relating to Shavuot. Um, One fifteen, I mentioned Mark Trencher will be giving a special talk on his recently done survey on singles in the Orthodox Orthodox community at 1.15, and then at 8.30, Nettie Linzer will be giving the Parsha Shear. She's uh, graduating Princeton University next week, I guess, and uh, studied in Migdalo. She'll be giving the Parsha Shear, and then I'll finish up the week uh, Friday morning, my class on the sitter. Okay, we'll look forward to learning with you. Uh, please invite a friend, and uh, everybody have a good night, and thank you, Michelle. Be well, and everybody be well, and Lila Tov, and uh, let's hear good things. Okay, thank you very thank much, you. everybody.